everyone. Can, so Christina is an outdoor educator and nature enthusiast. She has had a fascination for edible plants since she was a child and has been apprenticing under author and naturalist Peggy Lance for a year and a half. Christina works with children and families daily and has a passion for bringing more people outdoors, especially for foraging. Today, Christina will be presenting us with foraging tips, resources, and recipes. Native edible, wild, and landscape plants will be discussed along with how to use them and cooking demonstrations. And Christina, you can go ahead and share your screen, I believe. All righty, one second. Do, do, do. Can you see it? Not, oh, yes, yeah, there it is. Awesome. All right. I'm going to pull up the slideshow and I won't be able to see you anymore. So just warning you there. Oh, I can actually still see you. Excellent. <laughs> All right. Are you able to see the whole thing? Yes. Okay, excellent. Perfect. So hello, everyone. I am so excited to finally be doing this. Um, for those of you who don't know, I have been attempting to do this or a similar presentation for several years, and it has been constantly moved and postponed, and I'm finally doing it, so I'm very excited to be sharing with you some urban and backyard foraging. So you can find some tasty edibles right in your own yard. <laughs> um, so as I said, my name is Christina. I am a mom, I am an outdoor educator, and I am a plant enthusiast. My earliest memories are actually of being outdoors, usually up a tree or hiding in one of the natural forts that was growing in the hedges. And I've always been fascinated by plants. Though I have no formal education in botany or the like, but I have been lucky enough to become a sort of apprentice under Peggy Lance. And through her extremely patient teaching and gentle heckling, I, I have learned so much. So as I said, I am no expert. I merely tend to obsess and absorb as much as I can about a very small number of topics. I am not a scientist and most of the botanical names that I've only ever read and never heard. So I'm probably more likely to accidentally summon a demon tonight than I am to actually pronounce any of the names correctly. So please forgive me. So, Foraging is more than just plants. Foraging is much more than just going out, identifying some edible plants and coming back with a basket full of tasty goodies. I mean, that's part of it, of course, uh, but it's about creating a deeper bond with nature and to leave with a better understanding of the world around us. And to that end, we are nature's interpreters. So what does interpretation mean? According to the National Association for Interpretation, it is a mission-based communication process that forges emotional and intellectual connections between the interests of the audience and the meanings inherited or inherent in the resource. So to me, that means we're like translators for mother nature. And our job is to help people connect with her in a way that they can understand and appreciate. So foraging is much more than just plants. Let's quickly talk about the importance of getting outdoors for kids and adults alike. So nature is the best teacher. It teaches us all that we are all interconnected. It shows us wonder and it inspires awe and it, it shows us everything changes, right? So what does, what does science say? Well, being outdoors boosts the immune system. Not only that, nature helps provide protections against obesity, ADHD, depression, heart disease, and more. Being outdoors restores focus. 
in a study published in the September 2004 issue of the American Journal of Public Health, volume 94, number nine, if you wanna look it up, scientists found that green outdoor activities reduced ADHD symptoms significantly more than activities in built outdoor and indoor settings. And if you need evidence that nature makes us better people, Berkeley researchers exposed participants to more or less subject subjectively beautiful nature scenes and then observed how participants behaved playing two economic games that measure generosity and trust. And after being exposed to more beautiful scenes, participants acted more generously and more trusting. Now, I'm more interested in what the artists have to say. Author Edward Abbey says, wilderness is not a luxury, but a, necess a necessity of the human spirit. Frank Lloyd Wright, one of my favorite architects said, study nature, love nature, stay close to nature. It will never fail you. And finally, the great novelist and short story writer, Alice Walker said, in nature, nothing is perfect and everything is perfect. Trees can be contorted, bent in weird ways, and they are still beautiful. And I think that's beautiful. All right, so some important rules before we move on, uh, some safety. <laughs> Shout out to all those early humans. <laughs> so rule A, know what you're picking. That also means know what part of the plant to pick and also what not to pick as well. This one seems pretty obvious, you know, don't forage where it's been poisoned. But what does that mean? That means pesticides, that means herbicides, that means the streets where cars drive down constantly releasing heavy metal. So if your neighbor sprays their yard, you're not gonna want to forage in their yard, obviously. You're not gonna wanna go next to the highway where <laughs> unfortunately all of those lovely elderberry trees are. It's just not the best place to get it. And last, only take what you need. And that one could be a tough one but you need to leave enough for the birds and the bees because first and foremost, this is their food. We are their guests. These are treats for us. All right, let's get to the part that you're here for, <laughs> the plant. All right, to start, I thought that acorns, why not? We'll start in alphabetical order. So oaks, any oak is, it has edible parts. This is actually the large oak tree in a local park I have here. We call it our friendship tree. This is where we actually would meet every week for our nature activities and songs and everything. But the best advice to find an oak would be look for the acorns. And that sounds silly, but Oak trees come in every shape and size. Their leaves are completely different. Some are pointed, some are round. There's so many types of oaks. So the best way to find an oak would be look for the acorns in the fall. And they may not seem edible, but they are. It takes a lot of effort, but if you find a good white oak tree in particular, um, they have less tannins than red oaks you can process those acorns into flour to make pancakes or um, all sorts of things like that. Use it as, uh, in breads and any of those lovely, lovely things. All right, uh, you probably recognize this one as Beautyberry, Calicarpa Americana. And you can tell by its little BB size purple berries that show up every fall clustered around the stem. Um, yes, the berries are edible by themselves, very boring, a bit astringent, not the greatest tasting thing, but you can take that little berry and you can turn it into jams and jellies. And later I'm actually gonna show you how to make some beauty berry muffins 
for me, uh, when you cook with the beauty berry or you dry the beauty berry, they tend to taste a bit like raisins or currants. There's apparently an Asian variety um, that also grows around the state that um, has smaller berries, but it's much sweeter, apparently. I have not come across that yet, so that's something to look for out there. Here is the recipe card. You should have that um, if you are in attendance there. Um, and like I said, I'll go over how to make these later as well. All right. Next, we have blackberries or rubus spo, rubus species. Um, also raspberries, dewberries. They're all going to look very, very similar. They're going to have these white flowers here. They're going to have the the jagged edges. Um, most raspberries have three leaves while blackberries will have five. Um, they grow from a cane um, from the ground. Some will be extremely spiny like the ones you see here. These grow out behind our condos and they're extremely spiky but delicious and worth all of the prickly pokes. Um, some will not have quite as many, so you might not get quite as scratched, um, but you have to be quick because the birds will get them if you are not there on top of things. Um, the berries only grow on the second year canes, so if you have a tendency to cut them, you're not going to get the berries, so let them grow so that they, that they can bury as well. Of course, obviously you can make all sorts of things with blackberries, so I won't go into all of the hundreds of things that you can make with that. <laughs> This one might seem a little strange, but this one is bottle brush. Um, it is a very common plant to find in neighborhoods. Um, this one is actually in my neighborhood. That's my daughter, Dora, there. She loves this one. Um, you can make a tea from the leaves, and you can actually sweeten that tea simply by using the flowers and dunking that in as well. There are many things that you can make teas with, and this happens to be one of them. Um, and it's just one way that you can use some of these landscaping plants that a lot of people throw in. Even though it's not a native, it's still a delicious, delicious tea to try. Here we have dollar weed, hydrocodal. Um, this one is my son's favorite. You can see this one's actually quite a, a large one right next to my hand. It was a good, my hand's not very close to it. I was trying to take a picture at the same time, but it was almost three inches across. You can find these. If you find them, it's because it's damp. You're probably over watering. Um, so if you want to get rid of them, cut back on the water. Otherwise, throw them in your salad. They are more nutritious than spinach and they taste a bit like it as well. Um, they can be eaten raw or cooked, um, the flowers as well. And these pop up all year long. Next, we have elderberry sambucus. Um, this one, you can tell usually by the flower, the umbel is the easiest way to tell. Um, it, there is a similar lookalike, which I'll go over in just a second, which I, until I saw it in person, didn't realize it was not as much of a lookalike as I realized. Um, but this, you can actually make all sorts of things from elder flowers and elder berry. Um, the flowers, you can take the pollen and again, use that like flour, throw that in with your pancakes. You can use the flowers themselves to make um, cordial. Um, the berries, you can turn into jelly or syrups. It's very good for cough as well. Um, however, you want to be careful to remove all of the stems and make sure you don't have any leaves or anything in there when you go to make your tea or your jelly as um, all the other parts of the elderberry are toxic. Not so good on the tum-tum as I tell my kids. Here are a few that some people may 
accidentally uh, ID as elderberry, uh, not elderberry. <laughs> this first one with the ladybug and the beetle, that one is actually water hemlock. So that's the one that is really important to tell the difference. Um, it looks similar here because I have a zoomed in picture, but um, if you see it in person, it has much smaller um, clusters of flowers, so little mini umbrellas as opposed to one large umbrella. They also don't bury either, so that's another way to tell the difference. Um, for older hemlock, the wood will also begin to turn purple as well, so that's a very colorful way to tell the difference. I also have here in the upper right corner, that one is a button bush. Um, and down in the bottom, uh, if I remember correctly, that one is a hemp vine. So they do have slightly similar flowers in that they're white. Um, they kind of cluster, but these are the lookalikes of elderberry. Here I have some elderberry blossom tea from this one is actually from Peg's book from Florida's Edible Wild Plants. And it is really, really yummy. So I encourage you to try this one out. All right, so here I have great Vitus spa. Uh, most of what you find across Florida are going to be muscadine or some hybrid of muscadine grapes. And those generally begin to show up in the summer. Uh, you can eat the young leaves in the fall. Um, you can use them to uh, wrap. They used it a lot in Greek cooking. And then the fruit in the late summer or fall, if you can get there before the birds. Um, some are sweet, some are sour, some have a ton of seeds, some don't have any, hardly any seeds. Um, so it's really about finding the right vine. And it's funny because it seems like 90% of what you're gonna find are the male vines, no, no berries, nothing. So if you find that female vine, you find those berries, keep that spot in mind, don't lose it. Um, one similar lookalike to look out for would be something called moonberry. And the easiest way to tell the difference would be to simply, sorry, my dog, would be to simply cut open the berry and inside it'll have a seed that it looks like a, a crescent or a half moon. So it's known as a moon berry. Um, as I mentioned, you can use the leaves um, in salad, uh, stuffed dolmas, and then the berries are best as jelly as opposed to a table berry. Next is Smilax. We have 12 species here in Florida. Um, eight uh, you'll find commonly, and they are all different shapes. Here um, I have one that is from the Oakland Nature Preserve, where I am lucky enough to have permission to forage. Um, you see down in the bottom of that large picture there that overwhelmingly large uh, vine. Um, the leaves on this, they're all going to be a little bit different depending on the species. Some are this arrow shape that I have in the picture, some are more of a heart shape, some are rounder. Some are going to be covered in spines and some are going to have no thorns at all. Um, all of them though do have edible parts. Here I have pictured um, the tips of the vine growing, which looks a little bit like a squid. Um, and you can actually take that just right as far down as it will break off cleanly on its own. So anywhere from about six inches to even two feet long, um, a nice tender shoot. It tastes like asparagus and can be eaten raw or cooked up, like I said, like asparagus, so baked. Um, and the root, if you want to put a lot of effort in, you can dig up that root and you can actually make a root beer either carbonated like the soda or um, alcoholic as well. Here I have Yopan Holly. I like the Vomitoria. Um, I believe you have some there with you. So if you haven't tried it yet, 
I encourage you to taste some of it, but if you are sensitive to caffeine, um, I recommend starting small amounts. Um, this is the only caffeinated plant in North America, and it is even more highly caffeinated than coffee. You can have the leaves all year round. The leaves of any holly can be turned into tea, but the berries of all holly are toxic. So you don't wanna have those, leave those for the birds. Um, different species of holly prefer different growing conditions. So you're gonna find them anywhere from, you know, dry uplands all the way into slightly wetter um, transition areas towards the wetlands as well. Um, this is most famous or the Seminoles having used it as their black drink. They would brew it to excess and then drink it to excess and use it as a way of cleansing the body before a hunt or for other things as well. Um, just a note on the holly leaves. If you do decide to make tea, it is important that you dry them until they are nice and brown and crisp before turning them into tea. I have used them fresh um, before reading that and learning that without any ill effects, but I do recommend you follow all those guidelines. This is maypop or passion flower. Passiflora, Passiflora species. We have seven native versions of this and three non-native here in the state. And the most common is gonna be this purple one. It has that distinct three lobed leaves. They're all the species are going to have those three lobes to some degree. Um, this one in particular, in particular, you can see very deep, deep lobes. Um, the fruit turns yellow when it's ripe, and some species you can eat the entire fruit, some you want to suck the juice out, and others, like I have, of a corky stem passion vine, that is, I mean, it fruits, and this, it tasted I suppose it wouldn't be so bad knowing now, but it tasted a bit like tomato with an, a very astringent aftertaste. So I don't recommend the corky stem, but if you happen to find those nice, large passion fruits, they are a wonderful native find. You can also turn the flower into tea and it's very calming for right before bed. So that is another way that you can use passion vines. Here are some other versions of the passion vine. Um, the middle is my tiny little quirky stem. On the left, I believe is the invasive one. And then we have another here on the right. All right, this is spotted bee balm, Monarda punctata. And it is in the mint family all the way back. Um, and you can use the leaves of this, any mint, um, so square stem and smells minty. You can use the leaves as a tea. Um, you can also use the flower of this as a tea. I do caution you though to brew this extremely lightly um, using only one or two leaves, especially to start as it is, um, it is very high in a compound called thymol, um, which is a depressant similar to alcohol. So that's something to consider. Um, however, it is a very soothing tea when it is brewed lightly and it is, is quite delicious as well. It has a slight minty flavor. This is another of my son's favorite plants. This is poor man's pepper. Um, this one, it, there are a few different versions. It's in the mustard family. Um, and you can use this, the leaves, the fruit, the seeds, the root, the entire plant is edible. Um, the seed.
specifically you can use at the party table on the salad as well. So you can use those um, as a nice garnish on your salad, or you can cook them up as well. It's like a yeah, green. Um, the root is apparently uh, like Florida's horseradish. You can grind it and use it as a horseradish. I have attempted this, but I don't think I did it right. So um, that's one that I'm going to do attempt again that fascinates me but it's found in disturbed sites all across the state you're going to find it in your yard you're going to find it all over the place if it's mowed it will most likely be growing um, as I mentioned that's in the mustard family just like broccoli um, there's also other versions called um, very similar to this called tansy mustard which has a long skinny seed but otherwise looks almost identical or shepherd's purse where the seeds are heart-shaped. But again, the plant itself is almost identical. All right, so this is my demonstration. I'll walk you through the uh, process of creating beauty berry muffins. Um, so if it doesn't play on that end, please let me know, but enjoy. You don't have quite super sweetness that you would from like a blueberry muffin they have a slight almost an allspice flavor to them they kind of give it a bit of a raisiny kick it's really really good so highly recommend this i hope you enjoy it i hope you also take the time to make these beautiful muffins i would love to see them if you do but thanks for hanging out with me while I cook. So I saw in the chat that the audio didn't work in the video. I'm really, really sorry about that. Um, if you would like to go at some point onto YouTube, I think I saw that the link was shared there. If you want to go back and watch it again, um, I think that was my fault. I put myself on mute so that I wouldn't make noises during the video, and I think that messed it up. So my apologies. I'm, I'm just learning technology. <laughs> Um, anyway, so moving on to our next plant, and I'm going to kind of speed through these next couple because we are coming towards the end of my time. I'm right at seven minutes, or I'm right at 45 minutes at this point. Uh, so here we have persimmon. Um, this is one of those plants you either, when you find it and it's perfectly ripe, it is so delicious, but if it is not exactly perfectly right, it will be the most sour, astringent thing you have ever put into your mouth. And you'll make a face like this because it will just suck all of the <laughs> moisture from your mouth. But when ripe and you find that one where you're fighting the wasps for it, um, it is sweet and juicy and delicious, and you can turn it into so many things. You can use the leaves in tea once again. Um, I have never come across a persimmon that did not have these weird splotches all over the leaves. So that's actually one way <laughs> that I have found to identify it as, yes, this is a persimmon. <laughs> Um, you can boil them as a tea. The fruits, again, you can only, when they're super ripe and you're fighting the wasps. Um, and these are um, dioecious, meaning they are a male plant and a female. You have to have both in order to get fruit. Um, so make sure you have both if you want to have fruit, if you plant these in your yard. Next are pines. Yes, these are edible, and in fact, they have multiple edible parts. Um, first is in the cone, that's where we get pine nuts. Um, the ones that we get in the store are all from California, the very, very large cones, so they have very large pine nuts. The ones here, if you want to spend a lot of time tediously um, taking them from their shell and roasting them, you can do that, and they are worth it if you if you feel so inclined. 
Um, they taste just like the big pine nuts you would get in the store. You can also use those pollen tips um, before they make pollen. So when they're still green um, and you can use those, um, they're a little bit sweet. You can fry them up actually. Um, any of the pine needles, you can turn that into tea as well. It's really lovely. It has a slight turpentine -y taste to it, but at the same time, it's very soothing. Um, and if you are desperate, you can even eat the inner bark from the tree as well. Let's see. Just gonna skip through a couple of these. This is pokeweed, Phytolaca americana. Um, this one, the entire plant is toxic. Berries, leaves, roots, shoots, everything. Um, however, when you find a young plant, barely knee high where you can still snap it off at the base, it can then be used as food. You want to boil it in several changes of water, at least three changes of water to get all of the toxins out of the leaves. And then you can uh, treat it just like any other green after that. So you can add garlic and onions and stir fry it up really yummy. Um, but again, once it gets any taller than that or it begins to turn red, um, then leave it alone for the next season. Leave the berries there for the birds. Um, but fun fact, the berries were actually used as ink all the way back in the Civil War. And you can actually find letters from the Civil War that can still be read just as easily as they could back then because the ink from the poke berries lasted longer than regular ink did. This is prickly pear, Aponsia. Um, this one you can have the leaf pads, also known as the tunas um, in the, or the fruit in the spring and fall. Um, you'll want to collect this with tongs, and that's not because of the obvious thorns, but because of the tiny little hairs called glow kids. Um, do not hike barefoot in Florida. My trail name is the Barefoot Gnome. I used to hike barefoot all the time until one day I was on a multi-day hike. It was dark in my campsite. I was dumb walking around barefoot and stepped right into a prickly pear cactus. Uh, I got what I thought was all of these spines and hairs out, but as I learned throughout the next two days of my hike, I had not. It takes forever to get those little hairs out, so avoid them. Now, once you do harvest the pad, you can actually just dunk it right in boiling water and that will take care of that and make it safe to handle. Of course, then you'll want to peel it as well before you serve it. You can serve it chilled, um, sliced over salad. And then of course you have the, the fruits there as a tea or juice, I believe is what was said. Yummy. Right, this one you will find all over your yard, Spanish needles, Biden's Alba. Most people think of it as a weed, but I think of it as one more food in my yard. Um, the flowers you can toss right onto a salad for a little color. You can take some of the brand new baby leaves, again, raw or cooked. Um, this one I always recommend, even if you don't necessarily wanna let it take over your yard, leave a little patch of it because not only is it tasty for your salads, but this is such an important plant for our pollinators as well. So leave a little patch of this in your yard. Um, also, I have read that the leaves of this can be used as a tobacco substitute as well. So a little something to keep in mind. We have spiderwort, Trendiscantia. Um, the leaves and the flowers are all edible. You'll notice in the right picture, we have the flowers and all of the buds. Each of those flowers is only going to last a single day and then it closes. And then the next morning, the next flower will come up. The um, 
Leaves can be used again as a salad raw, but they've also been known to be used as um, like you would an aloe um, for spider bites or minor scrapes or even minor burns. And we think that that might be where <clears throat> the, the term spider wart came from, um, wart meaning a bomb or a medicine and of course spider. Um, they also did a study back all the way in 1979 that they found that the hairs along the stamen, um, they actually mutate to a pink color when they are in the presence of radiation. So I just thought that was kind of funny. <laughs> this is sumac. This one is really yummy. These are sour. They make the most delicious lemonade. Um, or if you want to process them, it does take a lot of time and I'm not gonna go through the whole process of how to do it because there's some really great videos on YouTube and I'm happy to share some links if you wanna look up how to process them, but you can use this as a spice. They use this in a lot of um, Mediterranean cooking to make things like lemon pepper chicken. Um, I believe I left a, one of the recipe cards for that there. You um, can just dip the clusters of berries right into water for lemonade. Um, you can add it to boiling, tea, boiling water for tea, but um, don't boil it too long because they do turn bitter. Um, you can add some honey to that as well. Um, I have read that some people with nut allergies can have a reaction to this. Um, so just like any plant, any new food, um, try just a little bit at a time to make sure that you don't have a reaction before consuming large amounts of it. So here are those sumac wings. These are really good. I actually did this with just some chicken breast and um, cut them into little cubes and made uh, skewers of them with some lemons and peppers and put them right on the grill. And oh, so good. I highly recommend trying this. Um, if you don't feel like taking the 18 or so hours it takes to process these yourself, you can cheat and you can find um, sumac as a spice in your grocery store, most likely. Um, it is not the same species, but you will get very, very similar results. But our, our native one is actually much tastier too. So if you have the chance, try that. All right, this is tuberous sword fern, which is extremely invasive. So this is one that if you have on your property, eat the weeds. <laughs> Um, the tubers are what you're looking for, these little balls under the grass in the roots. Um, of course, they're extremely sandy in this picture, so you'll wash them off, but they taste a little bit like water chestnut, in my opinion. Um, you can actually roast them and they become sweet, um, or you can just serve them raw like this. I like to just slice them up and put them with my salad, just like everything else I've mentioned. Put it in a salad, put it in a salad. <laughs> This is wax myrtle. This is another one that you will probably find often in your neighborhoods. Um, you can, if it's not burying, the way I can tell it is what it is, is by the smell of the leaves. Simply break the leaf and, and take a nice whiff and it has a nice bay smell to it. The berries are coated in a type of wax. It's actually used in bayberry candles. So you can make wax candles from that, or you can grind them up into a spice, into a bayberry spice, or use the leaves just like you would any other bay leaf. This one is my favorite. It is a favorite of most of the kiddos that I work with. This is wood sorrel or oxalis. Every member of the oxalis family is edible. Every part is edible, leaves, stems, flowers, everything. It is sour. Um, that is what sorrel means. It comes from the oxalic acid that is in them. Um, a little girl that I was foraging with, actually, when she tried them, the flowers for the first time, she says, these are lemon flowers. So I always know this plant 
for me personally as lemon flowers. Um, due to the oxalic acid, it is one that if you have kidney problems like kidney stones, you'll probably want to avoid that just like you would any other food with oxalic acid. Um, spinach, for instance, um, actually has more oxalic acid in it than this does. But for some reason, you know, because it is a wild plant, we need to make sure that we absolutely let people know that this does contain this and that it can be an issue. Um, however, you can cook it and that will neutralize those oxalic crystals as well. So that can be one way that you can enjoy this. Again, raw or cooked, throw it in your salad, throw it in with anything else. I love to make this um, along with sheep sorrel into a pesto, um, along with some sunflower seeds instead of pine nuts, um, a little bit of basil and lots of garlic. And it is really delicious on bread with tomatoes. This is our wild green salad with all sorts of delicious foraged greens of your choice. It's a build your own salad, choose your own adventure. So enjoy that. And finally, just to end on this, a few things not to eat. Um, these are things that can be found in your yard. So especially if you have kids or pets, these are things just to keep an eye out on. Um, so if you have them on the left, um, we have, this is actually a type of nightshade. This is twin leaf nightshade. Um, so you can actually tell based on the way the leaves are growing, you'll notice those tiny little leaves directly next to the slightly larger leaves. Um, the fruits of this, they turn yellow when ripe as opposed to black nightshade and the fruits are much larger. Um, when I first came across this plant, I thought it was, um, I, I originally thought it was loquat before I got a good cl close look at it because the fruits, they're so appealing, they look delicious. So it's definitely something to make sure that you know how to identify. This middle one, um, this one is actually, what did I take a picture of? <laughs> this is one that you're going to find in your yard. It is pink flowers in general, sometimes yellow. Um, and now my brain has completely turned off because it is eight o'clock and past my bedtime. But the last one on the right, this one is actually um, a trick question. This one is a holly. So yes, it is technically edible. You can eat, uh, use the leaves for tea, but you want to avoid those berries. All right, so I am wrapping up. Oh, thank you, Lantana. Yes, that is Lantana. <laughs> I knew the name and it just totally left my brain. But <laughs> I appreciate that. Anyway, thank you guys so much. Um, I genuinely, genuinely appreciate y'all sitting through this with me for this hour. I can't believe I've actually talked for a whole hour. So I'm going to just say good night. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you again for having me. <laughs>
exit folders. I don't know how to. There we go. There it is. I've lost my screen. I don't know what's happened. <sighs> I'm sorry. I've lost my screen and I don't know how to get it back. And I just noticed that that doesn't have the bread on it either. So, or the milk on it. So I will make sure that I get that info to you. And I also cannot see any more questions. I don't know what has happened to my screen. So unfortunately, I guess I'm just going to call it a night. I'm so sorry, but thank you again for having me. I really appreciate it.